current Red Bull is difficult to drive, that much is clear. But why? What is it about the car's design that makes it so hard to drive quickly? Well, I spoke to F1 aerodynamicist legend Willem Toet to explain what might be going on with the Red Bull design, and what he told me was fascinating. Why the hell would you design a car that's that close to the edge? Well, the benefit is when you stall these little areas, unlike an aircraft wing, if you keep increasing the angle of a wing until it stalls, you will get to the point where you lose downforce, but drag is actually going to increase. We're going to get into it in this video. Everything from why Red Bull would design a car that's so tricky to drive, what's going on aerodynamically to make it difficult to drive, and how pushing the limits of aerodynamic performance creates a knife edge that only certain drivers can master. Now, I will say I've recorded this just before the Japanese Grand Prix. So maybe those certain drivers now include Yuki. So what makes a Formula 1 car difficult to drive? We've heard Liam Lawson talk about the small window, but is that real? And if so, what actually creates that small window? So it's a real thing. It's absolutely a real thing. Um, I learned some lessons about that in the past, say from the difference in driver reactions to updates when we put them on the car. With the design of a race car, a small window refers to the narrow range where a car performs at its peak, like a thin tightrope that drivers must balance on. And when aerodynamicists push for the most downforce and performance, they can create a car that only works well when everything, the speed, the steering, the ride height, is exactly right. And if you step outside this, there's a big drop off in grip. And this creates a fundamental choice that every team faces. Do you chase maximum performance, knowing it might make the car harder to drive? Or do you sacrifice some peak performance to create a car that's more forgiving? And this is something that Willem experienced at Ferrari with Schumacher and Irvine. They'd created a car that skewed more towards peak performance, but was difficult to drive. And as you might expect, Schumacher could deal with it and was still quick while Irvine struggled. So what made the difference? The difference was Michael Schumacher was metronomically precise. He was really precise about his the positioning of the car, the positioning of when he hit the brakes, how he transitioned from braking to turning. Eddie Irvine was, let's say, more flair, a little bit less precise. And that change in driving precision made a huge difference to what the car did. And we know the Red Bull also skews towards peak performance and that Max is so incredibly precise. To get significant performance out of the Red Bull car, which uh, honestly I think everyone realizes is aerodynamically not as good as two at least and perhaps three of their competitors. Max is able to drive a car where they, they stiffen it up and adjust it so that it is very much on the nose, aerodynamically and mechanically on the nose, so he can get it to turn in really beautifully. But you have to be so precise to use it. But what's actually happening to the car? And this is all the cars, not just the Red Bull, on the way into the corner that makes them difficult to drive. Well, when a driver hits the brakes and then turns into the corner, there's a complex dance happening between mechanical and aerodynamic forces. First, and as soon as the driver hits the brakes, the car's weight shifts forward. But with these ground effect cars, that weight creates a bigger challenge than with the last generation of F1 cars. So you can imagine that under heavy braking, you're getting weight transfer to the front, a mechanical weight transfer, but you're also reducing front ride height and potentially increasing rear ride height. Those ride height changes come with a change of aerodynamic balance. This is where it gets really interesting. That nose down attitude does two things. It pushes the front wing closer to the track, making it create even more downforce, but it also changes how the air flows to the floor. To a fairly small degree, the lower the front wing, the less air makes it to the floor and even the rear wing. So you end up with a double whammy of extra grip on the front. The mechanical grip is shifting forward and the aerodynamic balance is doing the same thing. Overall, the car's balance is moving to the front, which means the rear can be unstable. And it looks like this is particularly strong with the Red Bull. And this is where suspension design becomes crucial. With these ground effect cars, suspension design has become even more important to performance. Now, this generation of Formula One cars are much stiffer than the previous generation. Ground effect floors work really well close to the ground. And so you start 
the floor much closer to the ground. Therefore, you don't have that significant pitch change that you can use. That's the key. These cars generate massive downforce from their floors, but only when they're running at the precise height from the track. Too high and you lose performance. Too low and you risk stalling the floor. And so one of the suspension's jobs is to now keep that floor exactly where the aerodynamicists want it, even when the car is diving and rolling through braking and cornering. And this is where McLaren is doing something interesting. McLaren have this new, new front system suspension arrangement it looks to me like they've got quite a lot of anti-dive front wishbone instead of being a wishbone is two separate elements the steering is another separated element this anti-dive suspension design helps prevent the nose from dipping as much when braking and in turn that means more consistent airflow to the floor potentially giving mclaren better and more consistent performance into the corners likely making it an easier car to drive and there's something else that might help to explain why red bull's car is so edgy to drive a phenomenon called aerodynamic hysteresis but before we get into that, I want to tell you about our very own aerodynamics course, which opens up again later this month. If you've ever wanted to truly understand the science behind Formula One cars, this is your chance to learn from Willem Toet himself. Willem spent over 30 years leading aerodynamics at teams like Ferrari, Sauber and Benetton and now he's sharing his expertise through our in-depth course. You'll learn how F1 teams use wind tunnels, manage correlation challenges, and optimize error balance for maximum performance. Whether you're an aspiring engineer or just fascinated by the technical side of motorsport, this course will transform your understanding of aerodynamics. Head to driver61 forward slash education to join the waitlist for this incredible course. Now, back to aerodynamic hysteresis. Underneath a modern F1 car, you'll find powerful vortices. These tightly spinning tubes of air are crucial for creating downforce. When air hits things like strakes, floor edges, or turning vanes, it rolls up and spins fast. That that spinning motion pulls the surrounding air with it, speeds it up and drops the pressure. And low pressure under the car means grip. And as you know, in F1, grip is everything. So teams place these vortex generators precisely where they want them. And the goal is to keep the airflow attached and stable under the car, especially around the floor and diffuser. But here's the tricky bit. These vortices are incredibly sensitive. If the ride height changes or the car rolls too much, the flow can detach. And that's what engineers call a stall. And when that happens, you lose a chunk of downforce instantly. But here's where hysteresis comes in. Once a vortex stalls, it doesn't just come back when the car returns to its original position. You need to go further back. And in the floor's case, that's usually by raising the car more to get that flow reattached. There's a kind of lag or memory in the airflow. And during that time, the driver gets much less grip. So why would a team even design a car to push that close to a stall in the first place? Why the hell would you design a car that's that close to the edge? Well, the benefit is when you stall these little areas, unlike an aircraft wing or, a, or a, if, you, if you keep increasing the angle of a wing until it stalls, you will get to the point where you lose downforce, but drag is actually going to increase. But this is a different situation. Your floor is a fixed shape. In other words, when parts of the floor stall, especially the diffuser, you lose downforce. Yes, but you might also lose a bit of drag, and that can be an advantage on the straights. The teams obviously want clean, low drag flow when the car's going flat out. So when you have a stall on a Formula One floor, you will get a small reduction in drag. And so the teams are pushing themselves to find that edge, if you like, where once you're on a, in a straight line, you're trying to lose drag as quickly as you can because drag is what's slowing you down on the straight. And that's why the teams flirt with the limit, trying to get as close as possible to a stall without tipping over. The upside is strong, but the trade-off can be drivability. In a situation where you have roll, one side of the floor will have um, quite well-attached flow, the other will be at much higher risk of one of these areas stalling. So if the Red Bull have some of those that come in, let's say, a little bit of roll in the braking zone, then that's going to make the car incredibly touchy to drive. And that sudden loss of rear grip, especially in the mid corner or under braking, is absolutely brutal. Which is where Max Verstappen comes in. 
His precision lap after lap means he can keep the car just before that drop off. But for other drivers, one small inaccuracy can put them over the edge and lead to a mistake. So where does all of this leave Red Bull? Well, it very much looks like they've designed a car that requires incredible precision to extract the most performance. And now they face a fundamental choice. Do they continue optimizing for peak performance or do they sacrifice some of that performance to build a car that's more forgiving that both drivers can actually drive quickly? And in terms of building that car, is that even possible right now? And what's particularly interesting with this car is that even Verstappen has begun to struggle. Max copes, but he's also complained. So the car's been designed around him. You, why wouldn't you? He's, he's winning. You, you design the car around your best driver. And, you know, if you're going to make a choice, you, you want your best driver to win. But he's also complaining that it's getting quite tough. As we know, Liam Lawson, albeit during a very limited attempt, struggled in the Red Bull. If you want to understand why, from a driving perspective, watch the video just here. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.